Welcome to the Visually Hidden Selects podcast, where we discuss an independent approach to the art of cinema and explore the subtext of various featured films. My name is Peter O'Brien, and I am an independent filmmaker, author, and musician. My name is David Bendler. I'm a film and stage actor and a pop culture enthusiast. I'm Anne Milleville, a French screenwriter and producer. Today's VHS selection is The Outsiders from 1983, directed by Francis Ford Coppola and starring one of the most fantastic ensemble casts that you're likely to witness in cinematic history. Um, and it's based on a novel of the same name, written by S.E. Hinton. And as I mentioned in the VHS video, this is kind of the beginning. This is the birth of the young adult genre. So when you think about it like that, that's kind of um, a heavy legacy. You know, you just you went to school and you read the classics, but now like they're writing books for young people. I, you know, I, I would dare say you wouldn't have a lot of young adult media. You know, you wouldn't have like teen shows. You wouldn't have Buffy, the Vampire Slayer. Too bad. Without the outsiders. I'm going to go ahead and say it right now, Anne. I'm going to throw down. <laughs> yeah, but I have nothing to say about that. Yeah, for sure. It would be uh, bad not to have uh, those kind of things. It inspired uh, probably uh, many others after them. So... Yeah, for sure. Even if you don't like the book or the movie, you have to admit that it's an inspiration for others to do the same. So for sure. I'm, I'm not sure we have many um, books or films before that uh, talking about uh, adolescents and, and teenagers, especially by teenagers, because uh, Hinton was an adolescent when she she wrote the book, I, as I understood in your VHS video. So. She started writing it when she was 15 years old, so basically Pony Boy's age, and then she finished it when she was 16, and it was published when she was 17, and um, that's pretty remarkable. It's it's better than a lot of people, you know, can do, and, you know, coming out of Tulsa, I mean, there's, you know, it's not like the uh, publishing industry is there, and she has all these connections from her family. It's really, she just wrote a good book that people connected with through the characters and it kind of spoke for itself. But I just find it fascinating that it was teens and it was school kids that led to the film being made. They were the ones who petitioned Francis Ford Coppola to make this into a film. So, I mean, there were teen films and coming of age films prior to this, but really when you go to the source, it's, it's almost ground zero with the novel. I just find that really, really fascinating. And like, yeah, what a what a legacy to to have and be a part of for the film. So now I know you said in the video that you saw this, you read the book uh, when you were in middle school, right? When did you see the film? Oh, I saw the film way before middle school. Um, I was very familiar with it. They would they would play it on WPX Channel Eleven very often, and so I saw it a lot growing up. I was very familiar with the movie before I read the book, but it was required reading in seventh grade when my uh, when I was in school. And I, as I understand it, it was required reading for a lot of people in junior high. I think that's the reason. Uh, that's where Ralph Macchio first read it, and he fell in love with the character Johnny so much so that he like. That was his role that he wanted, and I believe it's his proudest role. It's it's the one he's most fond of is Johnny Cade and the Outsiders. But that's where he found the book and connected with it, and that's where I found the book. I knew it was a book because I had read the credits, and my sister, who's two years older than me, she read it when she was in seventh grade. But when I got there, that's when I finally got a copy to take home, and I read it, and I subsequently bought a copy, and... Um, that was when I found the book, but I'm guessing that you guys have not read the book. No, I, I don't. I don't recall it being required reading in school. But also, even if it was, there's a good possibility that I probably didn't do it. But that's me. Too cool for school. And I never heard of it before. Um, to be frank with you, so no, it's not a required book in France. And having Francis Ford Coppola at the helm of the movie, you know, and the storytelling process. I mean, at that time, he had already had a very successful career throughout the 1970s with The Godfather 1 and 2, The Conversation, Apocalypse Now, of course, damn near killed the man. <laughs> you downshift into The Outsiders. And like I said in the video, I mean, I think one of the key ingredients in his storytelling is a focused group, an ensemble. And he's really just telling a small, simple story, but sometimes it has this extravagant 
backdrop like the Vietnam War or a mafia crime dynasty. But The Outsiders, I think it's right up there and in tune with the rest of his filmography, more so than some of his later films. Yeah, I didn't watch it as a kid. I never saw it. One of the WPX uh, showings I missed, I probably saw it 10 years ago or something like that. Like you said, the cast is I mean, super fucking impressive. I mean, all those guys turned out to have really great careers. And Diane Lane also had a great career, so and still does. But it's a good movie. I don't I don't dislike the movie, but it didn't it didn't connect with me in the same way. I grew up in a very kind of blue collar town and right next door, like sharing the border and like where the high school was, was a very like well to do wealthy town, you know, white collar. So it's like that constant conflict. So I was basically like living this movie, <laughs> which I think, you know, added to my connection with it. Right. The, the film doesn't drag whatsoever, but mm-hmm. I felt like sometimes inside of the scenes, the acting felt rushed. Like I feel like they could have mm-hmm. took a little more time within the scene itself to kind of like, I don't know, get, get a point across or really pull out an emotion. The big standout, I think, for me is, I mean, C. C. Thomas Howell is fantastic in this. And I think I really, I really like Ralph Macchio in this. I forgot how good he was in this movie, you know? I hadn't seen it in a very long time, but he's really good in this movie. Like, everything he he does is is spot on. Yeah. Like Steve, I didn't really connect uh, to it. It won't take long, I think, to to forget it, to be frank with you. Maybe, I mean, the, the, the story itself, I'm not sure I'm going to remember it in five years, but uh, I was happy to watch it because, as we said, we could see the early career of very well-known actors. So it's always interesting to see their first or one of the first movies they've been in. And also to see a Francis Ford Coppola movie. I'm not sure I watched many of them, so I was happy to do so. But I mean, it's it's well done. It's when uh, well written, but you feel like it's for teenagers. I really feel that way. And I even read somewhere that it's in the um, British Film Institute's list of 50 films to see before 14. And yeah, I feel that way. I think if you watch it when you are mm-hmm. a teenager, you relate to the characters. So I, I, I can understand understand the story but i don't really connect to it and i'm not sure i'm gonna remember this movie uh, all my life long okay so the outsiders comes with an expiration date <laughs> from Anne. It's, it's only it's only good for five years and then it, it it's gotta go <laughs> yeah well and i find it fascinating too that it was written by a woman susan eloise hinton se hinton is the author and she wrote it when she was 15 but her focus was on a group of young men yeah, I think you can feel it in a way that she she stresses on, um, I hope I won't offend you to say that, but she stresses, stresses on the stupidity that testosterone can do to, to men, you know? It's just a stupid fights for nothing when you think about it. I'm not surprised it was written by a woman. And the only woman profile you have uh, in the film, she's quite strong when you think about it. For uh, for someone who lived in the 60s, you don't expect that from a woman in the 60s to, to be able to answer that way to um, a bad guy. So yeah, it, it's interesting to, to see a woman's point of view in the writing. I, I think this is one movie that I would really be interested in watching the extended version of because I, I'm very curious. When it comes to this type of stuff, it always annoys me, the, the studio meddling. And I understand why they do it for certain reasons, uh, marketability, you know, broad mm-hmm. broad appeal and all that stuff. But then I always feel like we're getting shortchanged because we're not getting the full scope of what the, the director had intended. And it's kind of not fair to him or her, depending on the movie. Um, so, yeah. So in this instance, I, I'm really going to have to hunt down this other version. I think I think you both have touched on kind of an important thing um, with everything you both just said with regard to your experience watching it and with regard to the um, edit of it. And it all comes back to, yeah, this is a film made for a young audience. The BFI were totally right in that, you know, you really should see this movie in your teens because that is the audience. It is a teen audience. And if you get to 40 and you've missed that boat, you're probably not going to you know, connect unless you are like really in tune with yourself and really in tune with your history and like have a good, you know, not that you guys don't have a sense of self-identity, but like there's a time and a place for this movie. And again, being a period film, it has that sense of nostalgia as well Mm -hmm. that can suck you back into it. But your life now is like dealing with like 
totally different issues and concerns. The point is that, you know, the executives who are well beyond this point in their life, they just wanted money. So yeah, like, why why would you have Francis Ford Coppola film the entire movie and edit the entire movie and then tell them, oh, we're not going to release the entire movie. We're going to cut 20 minutes out to make it make it more more acceptable and more more appealing to teens. Yeah. And it's like, what the fucking book right, what? was like suggested by teens and it's it's the story that the teens wanted and that's the story that I made and shot. Like, why not put right. this out? And it's like, because the the powers that be aren't aren't seeing that kind of movie and they aren't connecting with that kind of movie. So there is quite a bit more in the complete novel version. And especially if you've read the book, you know, you, you are a lot more satisfied upon uh, that view. I think inadvertently then what they've done now is created a whole tainted market of people who have an expectation of what American cinema has become, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, it's going to fit into this little time frame and nine times out of 10 things will work out for the good guys. And, and it's a very watered down, very blah. Okay. And then after a while, you know, something comes along and it's like, wow, well, it was out of fucking left field. And it's like, it seems like it's revolutionary, but like cinema around the world has been dealing with that since like they started. So it's just an interesting thing. I think that's happened here, you know, stuff like Richard Donner's cut of Superman two, Ridley Scott's situation with Blade Runner. I mean, the list is, yeah. is fucking endless of how they stranglehold some of these people and can't release the vision. It's, it's maddening. Mm -hmm. I, can, I mean, I'm, I'm annoyed by it. I can only imagine how they feel putting all that time and energy and fucking passion into it. And then, you know, like, yeah, we're not going to show any of that stuff. And if you're taking out emotional anchors or bookends mm -hmm. for the film, which basically this one did, it cut off the beginning and it, it cut off the end and it just gave you the middle. And it's like, well, there's no, there's no appetizer and there's right. no dessert. And yeah, like you said, it is very filling and it moves, but you are not getting the complete story. You're not getting the complete arc. You're not getting the complete development of these characters. And so, like you said, like sometimes, sometimes it felt rushed in a scene, but there was probably a scene that set that up. But yeah, like, that's exactly like, I didn't pinpoint it the last time I watched it, but this time I was watching, I was like, I feel like I was just thrown in the middle of something here. Like, oh, here, here, here are these guys. They're going to go do some crazy shit. And then, oh, they had a fight. And then I said, okay, it just, it just seemed like everything happened like rapid fire. It didn't give me a chance as an audience member to, to drink it in. As you well know, I'm I'm, a, I'm still a big kid and I collect toys and all this other stuff. And I think I have a pretty good handle on my inner child. I could find accessibility to some of these things, even though it might not land the same way if I was a teenager. But I can have the empathy for the character. I still felt, feel bad when Dallas gets gunned down. He's just so misled. He's just all, you know, just a, a kid who's all over the place. And it still registers with me and I feel bad for him. But I mean, my God, like, like mm -hmm. let the audience have a minute with these people. I just feel like, it's like let's just get to the fucking yeah. edge. It's like, like the store is closing. They're shutting the lights and they're pushing me out the door. I'm like, can I just, can I see one thing? Um, and then it's like, no, it's over. You know, <laughs> I think I will say though, um, as far as the, you know, the rest of the, I mean, because I really do enjoy every one of those actors, but I will say that there were always parts of this movie, even when I watched it, watched it the first time. That felt a little melodramatic, and I, I don't, I don't know who that's attributed to. If it's that, if that's Francis's fault, if that, I just felt like there's real emotion to be had here. And here's the, here's the, the difference. I think you could see on screen. See Thomas Howell gets there emotionally when he sees Johnny and what's going on, and you know, and I, I feel like you, you're watching Matt Dillon struggle to get that emotion out, to get those tears out, and he can't quite do it. That always bugs me when I watch it. It's just like, ah, yeah. Matt Dillon, as, as much as I, I like a lot of his stuff, one of my favorite movies he's ever done was Beautiful Girls. I love that movie. Um, he's always been like a, a, B, a B actor for me. He's never cr really crossed that threshold, in my opinion, of the A-list, even though he's been in a, a lot of A-list uh, things. But talent-wise, I don't think he's on par with a lot of the other guys in that cast. I feel like like his character, though, can't get there. Like, I don't think I don't think Dallas Winston can get to that emotional state. And that's one of the reasons why he suffers the fate that he does. And he leaves leads the life that he does is he's he's repressed and suppressing a lot of his emotion. So he can't get there. And the way he can get there is by acting out and robbing a gas station and pulling a gun on the cops yeah. and getting into fights like that's that's his character. So I don't know that. I kind of see what you're saying about the melodrama and I attribute that to 
to Francis because he's the director, he's in charge, and he could have he could have reeled it in, he could have redirected them, he could have done a lot of different things, he could have adjusted the mm-hmm. editing, he could have, you know, like that's that's on him, you know, he's the one helming the ship, and especially at this point in his career, if there's anything wrong with the movie, it's Francis. Right. Fault. Like, you're right. Cause... You're right. I mean, maybe I was just being a little bit too kind because he is kind of a, you know, he's kind of a legend. So, but well, yeah, but I, you know, and that's the, that's the funny thing though, right? Because you walk away saying, okay, well, hmm, was that a choice or is it just because I don't think mm-hmm. Matt Dillon's got that range? You know, so like I, I struggle yeah. in my, in my mind and not that that's the end of the world. It's not. I know that when I first saw the movie, like as a, you know, like I was aware, like, oh, I'm watching The Outsiders now. This is, you know, not that like it was on TV and I was catching it, but like the, when I started like really watching it after having read the book, um, you know, I, I honestly, when I was a kid, I couldn't have told you that Tom Cruise was in this movie and you see him on the cover yeah. there and it's like, okay. And in the, in the theatrical version, you know, he has like a handful of scenes and like really just one, like kind of like main dialogue exchange with pony in the house, you know, but in the complete novel, Steve Randall is a, is a much more filled in character with much more presence in the story. You know, not not that he's overtaking right. Pony Boy or Johnny or Dally, but he's he's more prominent. He's like what two bit is in the theatrical version. You know, he's a he's an equivalent to two bit in that he's part of the gang and he's around and he has something to say and, uh, you know, contribution. Let's talk about Tom Cruise for a second, man. He's so jacked up in this movie. Like he hasn't been. I mean, I think the, the last time I saw him that jacked up was when he was jumping up on and down on Oprah's couch. I mean, he was. He was in it. He was flying high, man. He was going. Does that does that backflip off the car? Whew. Yeah, that's just unbridled Tom Cruise. I don't know. I feel like everybody delivers. A lot of people tend to think that Patrick Swayze was maybe a little too old. I mean, he was 29 when they filmed this movie, and he's supposed to be playing a 20-year-old. And I get that, but... It works. He still delivers. Because he feels like he still delivers. I accept him. I do him. too. And it, he, because if we're going to play that game about all the people who played teenagers when they weren't teenagers, forget about it. There's nobody. There's no real teenagers. But you, he feels like the father figure, which is exactly what he was supposed to feel like. And now a word from our sponsor. This podcast is brought to you by Visually Hidden Selects. If you're looking for a spoiler-free recommendation of a classic film with professional analysis and insight, check out Visually Hidden Selects exclusively on the visually hidden youtube channel i love diane lane like i always have i always will and it probably comes back to to this to this movie beautiful woman very talented i uh, super yeah, talented even, in a perfect, perfect storm even, you know she's always she's always she is just such a strong grounded character and a strong grounded performance and a confident mm-hmm. performance you don't get this in the theatrical version but in the complete novel there's there's more with her character and pony boy and i think it also just kind of comes through in the performance a little bit stronger just like what she's doing with mm-hmm. her character i don't want to spoil too much for you steve or the audience who may have not seen it but i think Anne might agree that uh diane lane really does have a, a stronger arc in the extended version she really stands up to matt dylan in that drive-in scene in the beginning and like mm-hmm. listen no one plays a like a, a douchey tough guy like matt dylan he's cornered the market in that <laughs> in that regard he's great at that um, um, but uh, she really, she holds her own. She gives it right back to him and good for her. My favorite scene in the movie is probably uh, the, the one we just talked about when um, Pony Boy uh, introduced himself to, to Cherry. I think it's a very nice uh, scene because as we said, Cherry is a very, I, I love this character too. I think for me, it was the the best character with Pony Boy. It's, th- those two are very really strong characters because you understand there there is more than what we see at first sight with them. Pony Boy, just with his introduction to Cherry, you understand that he's wiser than the rest of the group. And, and Cherry, you see that she looks like a fragile woman with a friend, but actually when she's in danger, she can fight for something, you know, she can fight for herself. And uh, also she understands what's going on between the two gangs, if, even if she doesn't agree on that. And I feel she's probably the voice of the one who wrote the book in a way. I was thinking that's a very interesting point. Thank you. 
because I didn't know that Essie Hinton was a, was a woman until until I saw the video, Pete. So once I knew that, and I said to myself, well, geez, I wonder why she didn't write the entire story in the point of view of Cherry, because I would technically be her, I, I would assume, and just like have her do the narration throughout. I get it's, you know, the, you know, the first person narrative is it's from Pony's point of view and whatnot. But I just thought it was an interesting thing that she didn't go that route. And through her relationship with this guy, relay to everybody what she, you know, what, how she watched him, you know, kind of break away from what everyone else was doing and kind of try to be that guy to, to, to have more understanding and bridge the gap. Anyway, that's just a random thought that I had. But I also, what I think really works for me is the fact that C. Thomas Howell and Diane Lane had a very natural chemistry. I felt like they didn't have to work on it. Like it didn't seem like oh, we're laboring away at this. No, it just seemed like very effortless. Probably my favorite scene in the movie is when um, when Pony Boy has a, that talk in the car with the Soch. And he's like, you know, they kind of realize that they're just people. Yeah. And, and he says, uh, he calls him Greece. And then he says, I didn't yeah. mean that, you know, like it's, it's just so great of, of the character of pony to be the one to like, I know your name. This is mine. Right. You know, he's, he's younger, <clears throat> but he's being the bigger man. Yeah. And I think that again, for me, if, if some more of those scenes, like when we first see the interaction between pony and uh, Patrick Swayze's character, that first time when he pushes him, like we barely, the, the cut's so quick, you barely see the push. Like you don't even know what the fuck happened. But let me see that relationship between, let me see, give me a couple lines of like, of some, of a real back and forth, like disagreement that leads up to that thing. Because just like, I, I, I told you, I didn't mean to come home late, shove, he runs. Like, it's, what, what just happened? Like, let me feel it. Again, it's not that I dislike the movie. I just, it's not as revered for me. And, and it really is something that I think, yeah, it's, it's true. You do need to find it, I think, earlier or, and that's why I'm curious how it's going to be for you when, when uh, your kids encounter it. Um, if you have that connection to um, introduce it to them or share it with them or explain it to them, because there are some very heavy uh, situations in here that, you know, not every kid has to deal with and not every kid as a result of dealing with has to process. But in, for the sake of learning about it, I think it's a great tool for, uh, it has a lot of educational value Absolutely. to introduce kids to very heavy topics and, uh, alternative circumstances. You know, I, I always tell my son, you know, like you better eat your dinner. Cause there are kids who are hungry in this city right now. Like not everybody has dinner. Yeah. Not everybody has a roof over their head. And, you know, in this film, you kind of get to see a glimpse of that. Like Johnny would rather sleep in the street than go home and deal with, with yeah. the problems behind his front yeah. door. Like my kids complain when I make steak. I'm like, you should be so lucky that you're getting steak. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's some people who are getting nothing. You're complaining you don't want steak again. Poor you. I always loved the the sequence at the church when they're hiding out and they're disguising themselves. <laughs> he's like, put the peroxide in Pony Boy's hair. He's like, yeah, I look real tough now. <laughs> These guys like butchered yeah. mop haircut. But the uh, the climax of that sequence, of course, with the church burning down, and those are the guys who go into the burning building. Those are the heroes. Those are the ones who save all those kids. Like to me, it's a very um, strong turning point point in the uh, characters stories you know because now they are the outsiders they are the misfits they are you know the the dregs of society in a way and they have no no hope of a future but they're also the ones who go into the burning building and that again ties into that white collar blue collar kind of lifestyle it's like firemen don't put on a white shirt and go sit behind a desk all day they carry the person out of the building when it's on fire they are the heroes i feel like that's a really kind of um poignant moment in the film and like i said it's sort of a turning point because yeah they are fugitives at that point you know johnny did kill bob pony boy is his accomplice and you know so is so is dallas but they aren't bad people they were defending themselves and i think that's where like you know it gets really interesting as it plays with that gray area and that perception of a of a person and their standing in society or their class or whatever you want to however you want to describe it i feel like that's one thing that this movie tackles and succeeds with you know it's like you aren't necessarily where you come from and just because you have limited means does not mean that you are limited yeah and i think that's a great point and i think that leads into the my favorite scene is when is when randy sees that in the paper that he, he can't believe that this 
this kid would would do that like he says i don't know if i would be able to do that so maybe he's not better than me but just like has more courage in that regard and like i think it helped him view him in a different light all they needed was a, a moment for some understanding and i think that that action of saving those kids provided that moment where they could kind of bridge the gap and yeah it's definitely a turning point in the story before that you feel that pony boy and and johnny are kind of cowards because they're running away from the consequences of what they've done but suddenly they're not the cowards because they, they are the ones going to the fire just to save people they don't know and then the consequences of of going in the fire to save people will be really important especially for pony boy because when johnny dies it's a big thing for him and for the rest of the gang so yeah it's definitely a turning point in in the story yeah the the loss of johnny i mean when you think about it it's like okay well where's this movie going before the church fired and let's not overlook the fact that like it burned down because they left their cigarettes yeah. in there. Like they mm -hmm. burned it down. So there's a responsibility in there as well. But there's also the fact that they do go back and they do save the kids. Like they're taking responsibility for their actions. And that's also kind of a theme. And I think that's also an important theme that, you know, especially young people should see and experience. Like Johnny was going to go back. So he's already made up his mind to be responsible. Mm -hmm. And then it's compounded and exacerbated by the fire. Yeah. The film has a great sense of uh, brotherhood and Dally doesn't want to go in. He's like, what, what are you doing? And then Johnny's in there and he's like, well, shit, now mm -hmm. I got to go right. in because my brother right. is in there. My friend is in there. Like I have to go help him. Like, and I don't think the socios would have done that. I think they would have just stood by their Mustang and waited for the fire department. If, if one of their friends was in there. Actually, I'm surprised that we didn't talk about the visuals because, um, that's something I didn't like in this movie, the visuals on some scenes, for example, the, the scene with the, the sunset, when they look at the sunset, it looks super, super fake. Uh, or even when the church is in fire, I'm I'm surprised about the fire. I don't know if you had the same feeling, but I wouldn't be surprised to hear that it's it, it's not a real fire that they they put uh, smoke and and flames uh, in post production or something because it really looks that way. I see what you're saying, and that's stuff that kind of you know, if, if I'm if, you know being completely honest, it made the quality feel a bit cheaper than what it probably should have looked like. Well, in defense of the film, the film is being told from Ponyboy's point of view and his memory. No, 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 no. And don't so don't do that. When we're seeing it play out, <laughs> don't make sense of it? Oh, okay. I won't explain anything. No, but he's it's his it's his memory and so some things I feel will be heightened and I'm not saying that it's it's perfect the way it is and it's flawless. No. I'm saying that like some of those sunsets, they are kind of meant to be exaggerated. I see what you're saying. It's not about the setting at that point so much as it is about what Pony and Johnny are saying, you know, in the Robert Frost poem. It's the symbolism. Yeah, of it. it's because that's the way Pony is remembering it as he's writing it. And so we have it bookended with him sitting in his room about to write it and going, you know, getting ready to write it. So the movie we're seeing is the book, which is told from Pony Boy's point of view, which is his memory of these events. You're a good defender of this, uh, this movie. I read somewhere that um, Francis Ford Coppola insisted on, he imposed some things to, to the actors to make it more real. And authenticity is something you, you talked about in the VHS video. Uh, you, you talked about the sets and everything, but also with the characters, because for me, the performances are super great. I think for, for young actors, I have nothing to, to complain about uh, any actor. And I read that, uh, for example, Francis Ford Coppola separated the actors. The actors who played the greasers, they lived, I think, on the bottom floor of the motel. Yeah. And they had Xerox scripts, whereas the Socias, they had leather-bound scripts and they got to live in the, the upper penthouse floor with a balcony and a view. So he was just trying to create that sense of envy and superiority and uh, class between the actors so they could bring it to the set. That's a, that's a pretty good technique. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic Go technique ahead. to do those kind of stuff. I agree with you. But I'm frustrated that I couldn't really see it on screen once again. That's the thing. Uh, that's why I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of pissed off about Coppola's on this movie because, as I said, the story, okay, it's not my cup of tea, 
but I could see the the work. But yeah, he, he worked so hard on the pre-production to do things like that. But in the end, we don't really see it. And uh, as uh, as Steve said, uh, maybe it was a. Uh, uh, it, more time on the characters would have been great because you talked about the brotherhood and yes we understand there is a brother brotherhood but i wanted to have more more of this in this movie you know yeah so so what i'm hearing from both of you is that you want more of the outside <laughs> you each want more of this movie well in this that's in, the takeaway it leaves you wanting more well, I, I i feel like it's more of a missed opportunity then uh the, yeah. the, the, like you know well and i'm not saying like go buy it and watch it like religion every <laughs> sunday but if you see it again i feel like having having the story in your mind now you don't have to focus on the story you can focus on other elements of the story or the relationships of the story or you know if you're like watching it for the actors now okay you've seen all the actors you know who they are you know how they interact now you can focus on the story like there's different things to pick up on different viewings and i've had a couple of films where it's like yeah you know what okay but then like i watch it again and it's like oh that dot is now connected and it clicks and I get it. I see what they were doing. I see why they did it. And I would be curious, you know, if Steve, if you got to see the complete novel, what your experience is with it. And of course, like I said, when, when your children start to uh, discover it, maybe it comes up in their curriculum. And, and I would be very curious for you to see the theatrical version, which is a lot leaner and what your experience is with that. And then I'd also be curious if you were to revisit it in five years when you forget all about it <laughs> and it's no longer sitting between your ears, taking up space, you revisit it and you're like, oh, you know what? Yeah, that really is something else. Or, oh, you know what? That still doesn't sit right with me. Or, oh, you know what? I wonder what Rob Lowe is doing right now. Let's meet in five years to to see. <laughs> you can do it. You can do it in five days for all I care. <laughs> but yeah, let me know how that turns out for you. I'm curious. I uh, I do I do agree that you know the reason, and I think I made this clear in the video too. The reason to really watch this movie at any age or any stage of your life is really to see this cast because whether. Whether the story connects or the characters' plights, you know, affect you in one way or another, it's really the film is an ensemble and it's a fantastic ensemble at that. And it really just kind of sets a bar that I don't know has been achieved by new coming actors in an ensemble. Okay, on that note, we're going to wrap it up here today at the Visually Hidden Selects podcast. Be sure to tune in next time for a completely different conversation on a completely different film. And make sure you head over to our YouTube channel and subscribe so you don't miss any of these recommendations. You can catch Steve over at Steve's Pop Culture Corner on Instagram. Anne and I, of course, are also on Instagram as well as Letterboxd so you can see what we've been watching and find out what we think over there. And until next time, stay gold.